the Darwin Day has been celebrated with a public lectures since 2006. Science, rationality, and humanism are worth celebrating because these three forces are drivers of change that make the world a better place. In, in contrast, the recent conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East are stark reminders that simultaneously there are other forces at work that threaten progress and human well-being. Tonight's speaker, Eva Jablonka, was born in Poland in 1952, at a time when Europe was struggling to re recover from horrific atrocities that targeted min minorities. When she was five, her family emigrated to Israel, where she had her home and academic career. She retired in 2020. As uh, academics, we are individuals who pursue new thoughts to where they lead us. Still, as academics, we are also citizens, and our work is organized in institutions. Nations and institutions have broader toolboxes at their disposal than individuals have. So we would like to thank Aktivister for Palestina, who organized the protest outside, for raising awareness of the role of the University of Bergen and Norway. Eva Jablonka has welcomed their protest and will take questions and discuss the situation in Israel and Palestine after the lecture. As academics, we need to speak up and we need to speak together. In 2008, uh, Jablonka initiated a petition to protest against the policies of the State of Israel when it was causing restrictions on the Palestinian University at the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. As academic, she wrote, we see ourselves as having a duty to fight for the academic freedom of our pal Palestinian colleagues. We call upon the government of Israel to honor and implement the rights of freedom of movement and academic study and institution, uh, instruction in the state of Israel and the territories controlled by it. Academic freedom is not divisible and ca cannot be selective. The petition was signed by more than 400 academics across a range of universities and research institutions in Israel, not without debate. Eva Jablonka has been associated with the peace movement in Israel since 1981. We uh, invited Eva Jablonka to give tonight's uh, Darwin Day presentation in February a year ago. 7th of October, Palestinian terrorists entered Israel and killed 1,139 people, of which two-thirds were civilians. In a response out of proportions, Israel's armed forces have killed more than 28,000 people on Palestinian territory. Two-thirds of these were women and children. We ask you now to honor these horrible losses by joining us in a moment of silence. At times when violence surges, diplomacy collapses and polarization is fueled by shallow misinformation. Academics and academic freedom have an important role to play in continuing to discuss ideas and science and to point to hope and ways forward. Tonight, therefore, we meet as uh, free individuals unconstrained by ethnicity, nationality and religion or institution. We are here because we want to celebrate science, rationality, and humanism. And because we, want, we are interested in hearing, hearing Eva Jablonka share with us her thoughts, developed over several de decades on how consciousness began to evolve 
for its, from its simplest forms to the exception, exceptional role it plays in humans today. Then Jal will introduce Eva. Uh, so, so we say here that uh, Eva Jablonka is a professor of genetics, and that is the first thing uh, we say which is not true. And uh, we say here that Eva Jablonka is a professor of genetics, and this is the first time I have to say to you today that this is not true. So she is a professor in the history of the sciences, and she is a professor at this. She was a professor, as you know at this Korn Institute for the History and Philosophy and Science and Ideas at the Tel Aviv University. And this Korn Institute is a, is a kind of an elite institute in Israel, which attracts and accepts only the very best uh, professors. Uh, it is uh, sort of like the SAR Center here, but it's not attracting the very best and brightest postdocs, but the very best and brightest professors, and they stay there for this long time. So these are the topics they work on in, in uh, this institute, and she has been working on the, on the history of uh, biology. And uh, she has, as a geneticist, she has also then studied many topics in biology. And uh, this has, for instance, uh, led her to study epigenetics, which is the uh, uh, evolutionary, the changes that happens in an organism's genome after birth or it can be inherited from the parents, but it's not the ordinary part of the genetic code. She wrote a book about this in 1995. In 2000, she wrote a book about animal tradition, which is a different kind of evolution. It is the evolution which happens because uh, individuals learn from each other, the cultures and traditions that happen among, uh, among animals. And this led her in 2005 to publish a book called Evolution in Four Dimensions. Now, one dimension of evolution is, is known every, to everyone. That is the, the genetic her inheritance of kind of Darwinian evolution. The second dimension of evolution is the epigenetic uh, uh, factors. The third dimension is the social evolution that we learn from each other, some of us. And the fourth dimension of evolution is uh, symbolism in human beings and what has happened with, with our own species. And uh, much later on she has, uh, she has written, so she's made an update of this book uh, uh, 10 years after the first volume came out, but now she's made a new book about the same topic, Inheritance Systems and the Extended Evolutionary Synthesis. And the Extended Evolutionary Synthesis is a kind of heretic in some very orthodox Darwinian circles, and she stands for it and uh, bravely and uh, works for it. So uh, she and the heretics is that one shall not only think, think about genes in the Darwinian way, but all these factors together is, is what drives evolution. And then also she started uh, something like 2005 to work with uh, Simona Ginsburg on um, consciousness and evolution of consciousness. And uh, uh, you might think that the sensitive soul is uh, some kind of a person who is uh, a little bit shaky and out of balance, but the sensitive soul is uh, Aristotle's concept of, of animals. Animals is defined by having, in his term, a sensitive soul. So he is, she is in discussing uh, uh, consciousness in this uh, Aristotelian, with Aristotelian background. And then she's very recently then made a new book on the same topic, which is uh, not as thick as this, but uh, much thinner and with excellent illustrations by uh, Anna Seligowski, who's also illustrated the, the front cover of the other books, but here is Anna Seligowski's artistic illustrations on every second page through the book. So this is uh, um, the d uh, diversity of topics uh, she's interested in. And uh, you are here now to hear her talk about the uh, evolution of consciousness. And tomorrow at 10 o'clock at the SAR Center, the Mikael SAR Center, she will talk about epigenetic inheritance and the extended evolutionary synthesis. 
And if you think she's tired after giving two talks, she will then go on to take the third talk, which will be at the Ulrich Helsing in the psychology um, um, department, where she will be at the guest of the brain and consciousness uh, group and talk about embodied AI and consciousness. But now, the Darwin Day, welcome, Eva. Do you hear me? Yes. yes, good. Well, thank you very much for being here and uh, for welcoming you, me in your beautiful city, peaceful city. And uh, thank everybody. And uh, I'm also very uh, thankful to the students who came here, including the students who protested against what is going on in our, hor in our region, the horrible war that is going on there. And they gave these flowers to me. And these flowers stand for peace, for justice and for compassion. Let's hope. So it's a great honor to give a Darwin lecture. Darwin was very influential for, my, for me personally. Evolutionary biology is why in the first place I, I became a biologist. I, you know, I, I became a biologist because I understood that evolutionary biology is a key for understanding many, many different things not just in biology, but in general. It's, it's a very powerful way, tool of thought. What you see here is one of the pictures of Anna Zhilgovsky, and this is uh, Darwin in the Galapagos. So it's a big responsibility to give a Darwin lecture for me. And, and uh, I have to say that uh, what I'm saying and the pictures that you will be uh, seeing here are everything uh, everything is collaborative work, really. We always uh, work together, me and my students and my colleagues. And what you see here is Anna Zhiligovsky on the left, who did the pictures, and Simona Ginsburg, with whom I have been working on the evolution of consciousness in the middle, and myself, as you see, more or less uh, similar to whatever you see now, on the right. And... Uh, I want to start with something that Darwin didn't want to talk about. There were two topics that Darwin did, refused to talk about and to write about. One was the origin of life, and the other one was the origin of mentality. And this is what he says in The Origin of Species. I must premise that I have nothing to do with the origin of the primary mental powers any more than I have with, the, uh, with that of life itself. Why? Why? The greatest, one of the greatest evolutionary biologists, not the only one, but one of the absolutely fundamental figures of evolutionary biology doesn't want to think about these great problems. How did life originate? How did mentality, the ability to experience, not just to respond, how did it originate? What, what is going on? And it is particularly puzzling when you look at what Darwin was writing about, for example, about, about emotions or about, uh, uh, about uh, human evolution, when you're looking uh, at the descent of men and selection in relation to sex, you see that he's very interested in the evolution of consciousness in humans and what makes up evolution of consciousness. But he's not interested and he's not writing about the origin of mentality. He's also very, very interested in the expression of emotions in men, in men and the animals. How, uh, what... What is the function of the expression of emotions? What is how, how we can follow the evolution of the expression of emotions? So he's obviously very interested in, in, in mental life of animals and of, and, uh, and of human beings. Nevertheless, he does not talk and does not discuss the origin of mentality, nor the origin of life. Now, if you look at what Darwin actually wrote, not in his books, but in his letters, you see that he was not so, that he did think about it. He wrote to his friend Hooker, the botanist, that he's imagining the origin of life to start in a small little warm pond somewhere, some chemical reactions happening there and bringing 
this chemical, and somehow making from this complex chemistry something that can be called alive. But he didn't want to talk about it. In the same way, he was very interested in the origins of mentality, actually. And his young protege, Romanus, George Romanus, uh, he gave him everything that he wrote about instinct that didn't go into the origin and encouraged him to explore the evolution of, ment uh, of mentality, including speculations about the origin of, the, of mental states. Now, but he didn't do it himself. He was interested in it, but he didn't do it. In, and the question is why? Now, it's a difficult question, really, because I think it has a lot to do with the... All, first of all, it's a very, very, very difficult question. Because some, when you're thinking about the origin of life, or you're thinking about the origin of the ability to experience anything, to feel, you know, how can... It's, it's such a categorical, such a great leap, a quantum leap, from the previous state. I mean, here you are, non, you here you have non-living creatures and suddenly you have living creatures. It seems like a huge leap, a, a quantum leap. And it's not clear how you can bridge it, especially for somebody who thinks in an in a evolutionary, gradualistic kind of way. The same about mentality. How do you think? You know, you, know, you have all kinds of, let's say, creatures that respond to the environment in more or less complicated ways, but don't feel anything, and then suddenly you have animals that feel. Why? What's, what's the big deal? Why do they have to feel in the first place? And what is happening? What is making them feel? These are very, very difficult questions, and it's not a, a coincidence that these are considered to be some of the most difficult questions in biology today. There is... A, about the origin of life, we have been working for, I mean, we, biologists, chemists, scientists in general, geologists, have been working for at least 120 years, more than that, but in a scientific kind of way. Thinking about it, doing experiments, there, is a lot, there are a lot of labs that are doing origin of life that are trying to figure out the origin of life, how complex chemistry can give rise to something that we can call a life. In the, with the mental evolution, this was, uh, this, this was a, almost a taboo, uh, uh, a, a, a taboo subject for quite a long time. For a long time, people who were thinking about consciousness are using, as they called it, the C word. Yes, were well, thought to be charlatans, basically, or sh either charlatans or stupid or a combination of the two. Now, it's still, sorry, uh, it's, still not, it's still a big question, and there are many, many people who are thinking differently about it. So, it's a very debatable question today, too. And, first of all, before I start telling you what exactly, what, what uh, not exactly, but what, what different people think, I just want to say what I mean by when I'm using this C word, the con consciousness. So I'm, I'm try, I'm, I mean the most basic, non-reflective. No, yeah, you don't have to reflect about your feelings or about your thoughts. Non-reflective, subjective feeling that includes extraceptive, that is visual, olfactory, auditory, uh, in, uh, uh, experiences, interoceptive, internal experiences like pain, hunger, and thirst, and bodily position, proprioceptive experiences. So all the experiences that we feel, and th this is what I mean by basic consciousness. Now, when people are trying to think about it, there are many, many ideas that you will meet in the literature. For example, people will say, only humans are conscious. That's it. And this is because for consciousness you need language. There is a small, small uh, philosophers used to think like that, but there is a smaller and smaller minority of the, uh, the, the, the they shrink. The number of people who think like that shrink. Uh, most people think that it's not only humans that are able to have phenomenal experience, to experience something like pain, like pleasure, like having perceptions, but other animals too. But which animals? So some people say only mammals and birds. For example, there is a, a very famous uh, theoretical psychologist called Nicholas Humphrey, in uh, Cambridge, who thinks that 
this only mammals and birds can do it. Then there are people who think that all amniotes can do it, but only amniotes. It's, for example, reptiles, birds, and mammals, but not fish. Uh, amphibians, yes, and not, uh, and, uh, sorry, amphibians, no, and invertebrates also, no. So only reptiles, birds, and mammals. Why? They have all kinds of arguments. I will not go into that. Then there are people who think all vertebrates, including fish, can feel, and this also includes cephalopods, like squids and uh, octopus and uh, cuttlefish. And then there are people who think, well, we have to increase it. All vertebrates, yes, some arthropods, and some mollusks. Mollusks, usually the cephalopods, the octopus, the cuttlefish, and the squid. And then there are people who think that actually consciousness is a primitive of life, that once you have a living being, it is also sentient. It also feels, in some minimal sense, but it does. And then there are also people who think that actually all matter is sentient in some sense, that it is a primitive of physics, not only a primitive of biology, but a primitive of physics. It's something like energy. Somebody like Chalmers, David Chalmers, the philosopher, thinks that this is the case. Right? So there are many, many opinions, and people are arguing very heatedly about this. One thing that we realize that is missing from, uh, from a lot of these dis uh, discussions when we first came to consider this question was that there was no good evolutionary approach to it. And this is what we tried to do. We said, well... Let's have a think about how, this, how something like that could evolve. And the first thing that we thought was, w that we assumed is that consciousness evolved. So we didn't think that consciousness is a primitive of life, and we didn't think that consciousness is a primitive of physics. We assumed that at some point, in the history of life, in the history of living organism, consciousness emerged. And the question was, how? How to think about a question like this? So, actually, Darwin was helpful here, as well as Aristotle in a different way. Because Darwin, as you remember, avoided the question of the origin of life and the origin of mentality. Because in both cases, there was this quantum leap. There was something about it that was very, very... It was a different mode of being, basically. Suddenly, you have a, this leap into a different mode of being. So, and since we realized that there is quite a lot of literature on the origin of life, we thought, may, well, maybe we can learn something from the literature on the origin of life and take some principles of thinking, some of the principles of, that people used in order to advance their own ideas into the origin of consciousness. This was the idea. Let's see if there is some kind of methodological way of using ideas from the origin of life and importing them into ideas about the origin of consciousness. So we looked at the theories of origin of life and we found one that was very helpful to us because it was, uh, it, 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 it was something we could work with. And it was a theory developed by a Hungarian chemist, organic chemist called Tibor Ganti, who is not very well known in circles of, among the circle of people who are not doing origin of life research. He was Hungarian, and so you know, he wrote in Hungarian. It, he was only translated in 1987, and very few people read it. And, uh, but, but he's considered now to be one of the fathers of uh, system chemistry. Now, what, and Gandhi was trying to understand the, or the uh, to understand minimal life. He didn't, he, he was trying to figure out what you need in order to identify something as alive. So what he did was he compiled a list of capacities that are minimally sufficient for characterizing life, the mode of being he was interested in. So he looks at the whole literature on this huge subject and he collects all the, con the things that most people, the best, the best of the best, are tr uh, consider to be very relevant to the origin of life. And then he says, 
Well, all right. This is a list. It's like a shopping list. Very helpful, but it's only a beginning. Now what he did was specify the relations between these different capacities, these different items on the list. Right? And then what he did was to identify one property such that when we find evidence of it, we have evidence that the major transition to life from non-life to life have come to completion, that it is complete, that this is minimal life. And this thing we called the evolutionary transition marker. He didn't call it that. And a lot of what I'm saying here is a little bit of a reinterpretation of, of Gandhi, but it doesn't matter. He was basically saying this kind of thing. That these ideas were also developed by two, other biolo by two biologists, Ursh Satmari and John Maynard Smith, both of them evolutionary biologists. Now, if we think, if we can find this transition marker, this di diagnostic property that means that the transition has gone into completion, then we can reverse engineer from this the system that enables it. And, and then we can understand the dynamic architecture of this system. So this is what we did. So we took these ideas and we, uh, and we said, well, let's apply it now to, uh, to, uh, to consciousness. So the idea is this. You have this list of capacities. You see the lady here? Yeah, so she, at the bottom you have the list of capacities. And there is an agreement that when you have this list, this list characterizes a certain way, mode of being, let's say life. Or, men, or, or, or consciousness, or rationality. This is also a very spe special mode of being, ours, for good and, or bad. And then you can, we try to find something, a trans the transition marker, the tra evolution transition marker, that if it is present, the whole list has to be present, right? It's a diagnostic, diagnostic of the whole list. And this, and this is the transition marker, and this marks the presence of the mode of being that we're interested in. It's not a very complicated uh, uh, exercise in logic. But this is, I mean, this is the, what we tried to do. This is the kind of, it's not logic, it's this kind, this is the methodology that we used. Okay, let's see if we can do it. Now, when Gandhi was doing it, he was, when he was, his li in his list he had, Maintenance of boundary, uh, so you have, the, you have to have some kind of closure. Metabolism, stability, information storage, regulation, uh, regulation of the internal milieu, of the internal, of, the, of whatever it is that is stored in the entity. Growth, reproduction, and irreversible disintegration, which we call death. And he found, he suggested something that we call the, the evolutionary transition marker, and this is something that he called unlimited heredity. If a system has a capacity to form lineages of open-ended length, varying in open-ended ways from the initial system, this is unlimited heredity. And, in all, and the DNA system is an example of such a system. And if you have a system like that that allows you a huge range of variations. Of course, it's not unlimited in the mathematical sense. It is unlimited in the practical sense. There are so many variations that you just can't, you know, more than the stars in heaven. Of course, there is a limit. But, uh, but if you have this, then you can reverse engineer from this capacity to all the other capacities that have to be in place for this unlimited heredity system. For example, something like DNA to be in place. So this is the idea. You have a list, and you have unlimited uh, heredity as the evolutionary transition marker, which is a marker of a living system. And the idea is that if you are beginning to think what you need in order to have such unlimited heredity system, you come to something like a protocell. I will not go into his analysis, and he created a little model of this that shows that all the capacities that are in place that, that he noted are actualized by a very, very simple protocell. Okay. So we said, let's do it. So we, were, so we spent some happy years. I mean, the whole thing, the whole project took us 12, 12 years of, uh, of uh, work. More. 
more. Uh, but uh, since we sort of decided, okay, we probably have to write a book and not a series of papers. So, right. So, so, what we, so, so we went into the literature on consciousness, and uh, we, saw, we looked at what philosophers and psychologists and cognitive scientists and neurobiologists wrote about it. And we came to a list, of, a consensus list, that most people, if they found something, a creature, with these capacities on a different planet, would think, well, it might be conscious, it might feel something, and let's, let's treat it with respect. So what are these properties that a lot of people agree about that are characteristic of a, a, of consci a consci conscious mode of being? They are to some extent overlapping, which is good because it's a system property. So that, that it's good that they're slightly or, slightly or partially overlapping. So one thing that people talk about is binding or unification. When we perceive something, for example, an apple, or we, we perceive a green apple, uh, uh, perceive it as coherent, as green, as round, as smooth, altogether, there is a kind of unity in our perception. The other thing is global accessibility and pro broadcast that is central to some uh, origin of consciousness, uh, some consciousness theories. This is the integration among sensory, uh, motor, memory, and value subsystem that enable us, that enable the system to, uh, to, to have, uh, to, to, to make discriminations and uh, generalizations. And uh, also selective uh, amplification and exclusion. There must be a lot of constraints on the system, which are inbuilt in the dynamics. And uh, uh, selective attention, the ability, the ability to select, shift, and maintain attention is one of them. Uh, only one of them. There are many, uh, many constraints. Uh, there is something that philosophers call intentionality, which is uh, they have this ugly way uh, word aboutness. Yes, uh, what they mean is uh, basically mapping, representation. It's not just that we integrate information. We represent the world. It's not, it's, not, it's not simple integration. It's not like one plus one plus three equals five. It's something else. It's actually you map the world, both, your, both the world outside you and the body. Temporal integration also. Goal-directed behavior that is based on representations and predictive... Uh, sorry. Uh, yes. Temporal integration means that things have a temporal depth. So when we... Pr the present for us is not an infinitely small point between past and, and future. It has some duration. We experience it as a duration, right? And this is something that was very central to many, many theories of uh, consciousness or thinking about consciousness, phenomenologists, for instance, starting with William James. And then flexible evaluative systems and goals, goal-directed behavior, uh, based on representations of learned predictive relations among actions, um, uh, actions, outcomes, and rewards. And this must be anchored in some in 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 past and in, in what happened in the past, and also in what is happening in the present. And this allows flexible, prioritized physiological context. And then we have to have some kind of embodiment. People are talking about embodiment, implementation of action in a proactive body with object-oriented spatial cognition that requires many degrees of freedom, not just one action, possibility of one action, but many actions. And self-other distinction from a stable perspective. It's a sense of one's own body as distinct from the world. For example, we can, we can, see that we can feel the difference when we are tickling ourselves and somebody else is tickling us, right? This is a classic example of that. Okay, now, if we met a creature with all these things in another planet, we would think there is no... But it's, it's a chance that this creature has some kind of experiencing. We wouldn't be sure, but we will give it a big benefit of doubt, Right? So, okay, and this is something that a lot of people from many, many uh, disciplines were talking about. 
And then we said, okay, how can we operationalize this? I mean, we can't go to every creature and ask it for the list. We have to have some kind of criteria, some kind of, some kind of diagnostic, uh, uh, some, some kind of diagnostic transition marker, right? This is what we were talking about. And we looked at a lot of things, spent a lot of time and wasted a lot of time and went into all kinds of strange holes. But in the end, we found a mode of behavior, a way of learning that, that we thought is a good transition marker. And it call, we called it unlimited, uh, uh, unlimited associative learning. It's unlimited in the same sense that unlimited heredity is unlimited. It's just allows a lot of, com it's very combinatorial. Now, what do we mean by this? We have to operationalize it. We have to work with it. What does it mean? It means that an animal has to be able to distinguish among novel composite patterns and st of stimuli and of actions. So, for example, discriminate a peahen, for example, can discriminate between males on the basis of all kinds of subtle differences between it. Yeah? He, she said, this is better than this. This male is nicer than this. Or this, or, uh, or this dance is more beautiful than this dance, and things like that. So the ability to discriminate between, between things that are composite, that are made up of many different organized stimuli that are slightly differently organized, is one thing. Can you do discrimination learning? Yes or no? The other thing is, can you learn if there is a gap, a time gap, between some kind of neutral stimulus and the reinforcement, and the prize that you get? Or do they have to coincide? If you have, if you can learn, even if there is a small time gap, this is one of our criteria. Why it is one of our criteria, I can, I can answer in a question, uh, when the questions come. But there, there are good reasons for thinking that this is important, and it, of course, opens up a range of possibilities of learning that would not be open otherwise. The other thing is to be able to be flexible about the value of what you learn, of, of, of the predictor of, uh, of good or bad. So something can be good in one environment and not very good in another environment, or can be very bad actually in a third environment. And you also don't have just one thing that impinges on, on your physiology and on your behavior. There are many things that happen. You have to prioritize them. You have to decide what is more important. So you have to have a system that allows for that and manifests what is called in the literature of, be, be, uh, of behavior second-order uh, second learning, that is, learn on the basis of what you have learned already. So what you have learned already can become almost innate, developmentally innate, not genetically innate. Yes? But developmentally innate, it's a, an automatic thing, and then you can learn on the basis of this. This is already uh, a reinforcement. You can use it as a reinforcement, and then you can have a predictor of that. And this allows generalization, this allows a long chains of action and things like that. Now, this may seem to you like a very demanding list. You have to have discrimination learning and learn across a time gap and change your values and do second order learning. But apparently, but when we looked at the literature and we, and we asked who has it now, all these things, by the way, they assume the whole list that I was talking about. You cannot have these capacities without actually assuming that the creature can do some binding, that, the, that, there is, that there is a flexible value system, that there, is a, 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 that there is some kind of duration to time, and so on and so forth. I will not go into the justification of, of, of each of them, but you can't. That's why it's a good, it's a good uh, uh, transition marker. So fine, we have a transition marker. Now, so here it is. Yes, here is the list. And that our transition marker is unlimited associative learning, which we call UAL for short. And, it, well, it requires all these things. It requires mapping. It requires integration of sensory features and a and, and motor kind of uh, body image. It requires exclusion of irrelevant signals. It requires a dedicated memory system that stores event representations. It requires an evaluation system that, can, that is flexible and can prioritize things. And it needs uh, an ability to 
distinguish between body-generated and well-generated identical stimuli. Good. So we have something that we were, at least, satisfied with as a, as a marker. And this is the outline of the architecture that we were thinking about. We need something that brings together an integ integrated sensory stimuli, integrated motor stimuli that map the body, a, a value system which is flexible, and, a, and a, a memory system. And all this have to come together. This is just a little caricature, of course. It's a very, very simple model. We have a slightly more complex model, but we don't have a computational model, by the way. I have to confess to that. We, di we, we didn't make one. Okay. So this is the basic architecture, very, very, very basic architecture of the model. And it's a very general and descriptive model. And the important thing about it, it allows goal-directed behavior that enables recognition of predictive relations between composite, different, uh, made of many parts, uh, sensory inputs, action patterns, outcomes, and rewards. These are the things, these are the elements. Okay, so then we could answer a question, if, and we, we found it very good to think in these terms because we can answer a question like, what is the function of consciousness? If you accept that unlimited associative learning is a good marker for minimal consciousness, minimal consciousness, because you see the reflection was not part of our list of capacities, if you accept that, then all the functions of unlimited associative learning are also the functions of, of consciousness. And, it, and when you think about the world that you see, the complexity of the world, the fact that we see things like very complicated flowers can make where, uh, that are selected and visited by creatures like the dragonfly here makes sense Whereas it also makes sense that uh, uh, flower, that uh, plants that are pollinated by wind have no, nect no sweet nectar, no nectar, and, and they're white, like this one, right? Why? Because the ability to discriminate between different flowers is something that the wind does not have, but the dragonfly does. So we can make sense of a lot of patterns in the world and, and, uh, and, and say, well, this is the, this is the result, actually, of, un, of the capacity for unlimited associative learning, which includes all these things, among them discrimination learning. And it is the reason that we have the world, this rich world that we see here. And this is another, another example. Darwin, by the way, since we're talking about Darwin, was thinking that sexual selection by mate choice is a very good marker of mentality. He didn't say it in this words, but he did say that animals that have the ability to choose mates, yes, that they, and discriminate between ma mates, have a, a, have a mental state. And he described them as uh, joyful and jealous and uh, you know, all kinds of uh, words that we would be very careful about using. Okay, so then we asked ourselves, fine, we have a list of capacities that animals can do. We have a large literature about, uh, about learning, right? Uh, very, uh, let's look at this literature, 150 years of uh, work on learning in all kinds of animals. So who can do UAL? Which animals? And then we found out that vertebrates can do it, including fish. Arthropods, some arthropods can do it. This includes some insects, not all arthropods, and a lot, about a lot, a lot, a lot of groups we don't have any knowledge, or very little knowledge. And we have to accept that we, I'm, I'm just talking about what we know, not about what we don't know. And uh, some uh, crustaceans, decapod crustaceans, and some mollusks, the cephalopods, the octopus, the squid, the cuttlefish. Well, that was very nice. So we could say something, we, 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 I, I want to stress, we don't say who does not have, we can't say who does not have consciousness, we can only say the positive thing, we can say this ones, according to our criteria, if you accept them, do, okay, 
This is, it's a positive kind of claim. Okay, so these are the ones. Once we know that we are looking at this kind of capacities, like the capacities for discrimination for, and so on, and we, we look at these creatures, we can ask, do these creatures have a nervous system that can actually support these this, uh, functions? Yes or no? And yes, they do. So just, I, I just want, I know that you're very interested in fish. I want, you to, I want to tell you that fish tick all the boxes of uh, UAL. Now, so we looked at vertebrates, at insects' brains, and at cephalopod brains, and we found that they have the supporting structures very different in each brain, but all of the supporting structures for the, the capacities exist in these brains. And there is, this is a very interesting figure which shows the functional similarity in the insect brain and in the uh, mammalian brain, which is amazing because they are completely different brains. And nevertheless, the relationship between very, uh, very fundamental uh, structures and pro uh, that are responsible for, for processes of learning and memory and so on are, very, are surprisingly similar. What it means evolutionarily is open to debate. And now we looked and, saw, and thought, well, if we know what the supporting structures is, we don't have behavior, behavior doesn't fossilize, but brains sometimes do. So let's look at brains and see when these structures first appeared. If these structures show us when UAL appeared, and if UAL is a marker of consciousness, we can learn when consciousness first appeared. And what we found was that it appeared tw at least twice. It appeared first in the Cambrian, in uh, arthropods, and in vertebrates. And the second time it appeared, 250 million later, in the cephalopod mollusks. So this, with the stars there, are the ones that uh, the light came, came, came up. And we argued that not only did associative learning and especially unlimited associative learning evolve during the Cambrian, but it was also the driver of the, uh, of the great Cambrian, one of the drivers, not the only driver, of course, one of the drivers of the gr great Cambrian explosion. It led to a lot of antagonistic and cooperative arm races and feedbacks, which can explain the great explosion. I will. Now, a lot of people would agree with this more or less, and would uh, and would say that. Uh, and and more and more people are beginning to think that yes, it's not just humans; it's animals, and it's not probably not just birds and mammals, but others as well. And here is something from 2012. This is the Cambridge Declaration of Consci about Animal Consciousness. It says. Uh, signed by neurobiologists, uh, philosophers of mind, and uh, uh, psychologists, cognitive scientists, and others. The absence of a neocortex does not appear to preclude an organism from experiencing affective states. Convergent evidence indicates that non-human animals have the neuroanatomical, neurochemical, and neurophysiological substrate of conscious states, along with the capacity to exhibit intentional behavior. Consequently, the weight of evidence indicates that humans are not unique in possessing the neurological substrates that generate consciousness. Non-human animals, including all mammals and birds and many other creatures, including octopuses, also possess this neurological substrate. Okay, all I can say is that, uh, and, and, uh, and this is now, I think, widely accepted by, not by everyone, of course not, but it is beginning to be more and more accepted, and indeed, people are trying to extend the range of animals which uh, can be considered conscious. How long do I have? Huh? Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay, so all I, I, want, I want to tell you just a few things. That this kind of, uh, if, if we're right, and if unlimited associative learning is a marker of consciousness, this has all kinds of interesting predictions. 
One of the predictions is that experimental protocols, like uh, dis a destruction, when you sort of like, uh, there are all kinds of ways of destructing an animal when it is presented with something, so that it it's doesn't actually see it, or is not aware of seeing it. Like, and there are all kinds of paradigms, like backward masking, if it means something to some people. That this, so there are experimental protocols that we switch off conscious perceptions in humans, but leave unconscious perception in place. Now, we predict that they selectively will switch off the ability for unlimited associative learning, while simpler forms of learning can be, you, you can achieve them even unconsciously. So there is, can be unconscious learning, but not this type of learning that we're talking about. And as far as we know, this holds, hold, this, this seems to be the case. There are, uh, there are, there, there are experiments on humans that suggest this, and there are also beginning to be experiments on other animals that suggest that this is the case. Uh, one is in rhesus monkeys, and there's somebody in Haifa in Israel who's doing some stuff on fish. I don't know what's going on there. There's also some stuff in Drosophila, by the way. Very interesting. They're not talking about consciousness there, but they can see that, for example, it cannot do this learning of, with a time gap when it is distracted, whereas it can do other things. It can do simpler kind of learning, learning when there is an overlap. This it can do even when it is very destructive. Very interesting stuff. And there are other uh, predictions as well. I, I don't think I have the time to go into them, but for example, some brain, damage, some brain damaging, we predict that it will uh, not allow p uh, uh, the animal to learn by UAL, by unlimited associative learning, but it will allow it to learn in simpler ways. And we predict also that the neural correlates of subjective experience, whatever they will turn out to be in different animals, will also be neural, will correlate with unlimited associative learning. And this is a just part of a... Now, what I was describing to you is a very, very general model. And it's a very general descriptive model. And it has a lot of... Uh, it is based on behavior, mainly, also to some extent on neurobiology and cognitive biology, but it is the main thing, the main, the, the, uh, our marker is a behavioral marker. So one of the things we did was to look at uh, theor uh, dominant theories of consciousness that are based on neurological kind of uh, arguments and on neurological kind of data. And one of them is something that is called general uh, the uh, global neural workspace theory, which was developed by uh, Change, Dehan, and their colleagues in France. And this theory of consciousness has all kinds of assumptions regarding brain organization and brain dynamics that are necessary. And they based this theory on humans, on human consciousness. So they were looking at humans and they found, not very surprisingly, that the neocortex is very important. Of course, we have a neocortex, other creatures don't. For example, birds don't have a neocortex, and fish don't have a neocortex. So, but, so what we wanted to see was to look at their assumptions and then see how these assumptions, can these assumptions work for creatures that do not have a neocortex, that these capacities are implemented in different structure. So this, this uh, is... Uh, are the two figures here. Is one is the unlimited associative learning little toy model, and the other one is a kind of representation of the kind of things that you need for the global neural workspace theory. And what is nice about, and the reason that we chose this theory, among other things, is that there are a lot of similarities in terms of the kind of inputs that you need in order to have something like consciousness, you need sensory inputs, you need motor inputs, you need, uh, you need the re uh, kind of value inputs, you need memory, and they think that you also need attention networks. We don't. We think you need attention very much, but you don't need specialized attention work networks in simple organisms. Anyway, there was enough similarity there, so we looked at fish to see what, uh, what we know about fish, and this was done with Orian Zaks, who is a student of mine, 
brilliant st student of mine, and we looked at, uh, at the case of uh, basal uh, uh, jawed fish, and which, as I said, there is evidence that they can implement unlimited associative learning. So as far as we are concerned, they are conscious at, in, a limit, in a minimal kind of sense. And then we said, okay, uh, what, what do we find when we look at this fish? What, what are, are the kind of criteria that they are using in terms of the dynamics of brains, of conscious brains, implemented? And where is the global workspace? Because they, in our case, the global workspace is the neocortex. Where is there? They don't have a neocortex. So where, where, where does it happen? And what we found was something that we didn't expect. We found that the, the, it seems that the, hippoca that the memory system, which in us is the, uh, the declarative memory system, the hippocampus, in fish have a hippocampus homologue. It's called HH. And the hippocampus homologue seems to play a dual role. It is both a memory system, as it is in us, but it also plays the role it has two functions. It, has, it also plays the role of a, 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 of a global workspace. Everything comes there and goes back to other places after, uh, and there's back and forth interaction there all the time. The back and forth interactions are a general feature of uh, brain dynamics. Okay, so this is the brain. And, in, in, and I will not go into the arguments. I mean, we have a paper about this, if somebody wants to read it, uh, with a lot of data. And, but what, what, what it means is that we have to change slightly both our model, our unlimited associative learning model, when we think about fish, as well as, uh, and they, I mean the uh, global neural workspace people, have to change their model when they think about, about uh, how they represent the coming together of things into the, uh, the general workspace. So it's nice. It means that we have to, to, to change and to, and, to, and to take into consideration new kind of uh, a, a new way of representing the ideas, but it doesn't change the core, neither of our ideas nor of theirs. And there are, again, predictions of that. Now, I, want to, uh, I don't have a lot of time, so I, 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 I would like to say something about humans. But before, we, uh, but before that, I just would like to say that what we know about, what, uh, we can check this kind of assumptions, for example, by, doing, uh, by looking at different animals coming out of anesthesia, animals that don't have neocortex coming out of anesthesia and how they come out of anesthesia and compare them to mammals. We can do a lot of things that can give us, that can, uh, give us a good idea, uh, that, can, that can sort of examine whether or not we, uh, uh, that either support or refute the kind of uh, uh, model that we have in mind. Uh, okay. And we also, uh, uh, we also, uh, uh, we also think that there will be that uh, very simple animals will be able we will be able to show that they uh, are subject to illusions that they that they perceive th that you know you 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 can trick them with all kinds of illusions okay but before i go to humans and say something about them i want to say that we didn't there was no jump from fish to humans right i mean there was a lot of evolution was going on and one of the important stages was that our, uh, what we call imaginative consciousness, and this is when past me uh, memories and uh, future possibilities can be consciously experienced. Not just that they can sort of affect behavior and affect present behavior, but that, that we can feel something about the past, feel something about the present, uh, the, about the future. For example, we may be afraid of, bomb, of bombs and of other way of things like that. And, men, and there is, are certain groups of animals, both birds and mammals, some, some birds and mammals that we know have these abilities, imaginative abilities. Now, we have something that is very unique, and we think 
is also, is also a different mode of being. We are very, very different creatures from others. Of course, there is an evolutionary continuity, and there are many similarities between us and other animals, but there is a, a big jump. And this is our symbolic capacity. This is the fact that our values are not just what is nice or not nice for us in the terms of pleasure and displeasure, in the sense that, you know, we satisfy basic existential needs. We have, there are, we have abstract values. We have the, the good, the true, the beautiful. Our very important values for humans. We can die for them. And this is something that other animals don't have. And these values are embedded in the human existence. And this is due to the abil of our ability not only to uh, think, to, to imagine, but to communicate through symbols about the imagined. So we, our, and the, the, the most powerful capacity for that is the linguistic capacity. Language, as my friend and colleague Daniel Dorr said, is a technology for the instruction of imagination. And it is... I can, we can talk about the imagined, and the imagined is shaping us as a species. And uh, this is a great person, unknown usually in the West, unfortunately, Brazilian uh, uh, psychiatrist, Nice da Silveira, who uh, I'm giving her as, a, as somebody who is an example of a human being, a compassionate human being, who uh, she, she did not agree to do lobotomies in the, uh, in the early t uh, 20th century. She disagreed to do shock uh, kind of uh, ther therapies and uh, insulin uh, injections and things like that. She used art therapy. And uh, she was a great lady. So this is the best of the human now, I want to go back to, uh, to the idea that uh, we are the symbolic species is not uh, our invention. Yes, it's uh, some, uh, Ernst Cassirer, who was a very famous German philosopher, thought that this is what defines humans. He said that we live in a different uh, dimension of reality when we are compared to other animals. He said that we have new values that drive our, li our life decisions. And we're driven by the symbolic, as I said, by the good, the beautiful. And we also need the symbol-based agency, which we call freedom. And if we don't have freedom, we rebel, sometimes in terrible ways. And we live by this kind of things. Now, again, you can say, well, what led to this? How did humans become this creature, this kind of symbolic creature, what Aristotle called a creature with a rational soul? He didn't mean rational, really, just being able to do geometry. I mean, he meant the ability to think about thought, to reflect, in, and to communicate about it. And what we know about uh, human evolution is that our ancestors already, and we, what we know about ourselves, had uh, extraordinary lev levels of cooperation, highly developed theory of mind we have. I mean, we, I can know, I can look at, looking at you, I can assume what you know that I know that, or that you think that I know, and, and so on and so forth, a few steps further. Uh, we have very, very powerful mechanisms of group uh, bonding. We have a lot of social conventions, social emotions, like guilt, shame, embarrassment, pride. And we have a lot of moral norms. We have con complex, uh, sequential, and socially learned imitation-based practices. We, have, uh, we humans have autobiographical memory. We can go back in time and we can imagine ourselves, uh, okay, we can remember what happened to us, we can tell our life story. And we have, the more, and we have something, that, and we have symbolic uh, language. And what we suggest is the symbolic language, the evolution of symbolic language uh, is the evolutionary transition marker for humans. 
And I mean, once we have it, all these things, who, which already, all the other things which already exist in our ancestors have come, have become, become very, very powerful. And this, and, and the, and these capacities, all of these capacities, come with a kind of basic passion for understanding, curiosity, and tendency to, se- to seek and find relations between things. We are not the only ones. Other animals do it too. But we have a very, very, very strong uh, tendency to see meaning in things. You remember Hamlet sort of pointing to the clouds, to Polonius and saying, there is a weasel in the cloud. We see weasels in the cloud. We see all kinds of things. And uh, we need, uh, and it means also that we have to have very powerful ability to control and influence, control both to suppress, but also to excite our own emotions. We have a certain ability of controlling our emotions, which other animals don't have. They do have to some extent, but not to the extent that we have. And uh, this leads to our unprecedented uh, uh, creativity and also to our unprecedented cruelty and the capacities for dissociating our emotions from and justifying horrors as we see in the current wars and the current conflicts in Ukraine and in the Middle East. Thank you. <coughs> so thank you, Eva. Thank you for, <coughs> Sorry. For pulling us through the evolution of consciousness. Uh, and... Uh, now we have, um, we have a bit of a trade-off. <laughs> we have to be out of here. So I'll be, running, uh, I'll be organizing the discussion here when we have to be out of here by 6 o'clock. And also the last chance to get a signed copy of your books is 6 o'clock <laughs> downstairs. So we have to um, trade off the, the two uh, elements there, I believe. Um, and also there will be a chance to... Um, to have a, 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 a discussion with uh, Eva afterwards, whatever. Uh, if you want to talk politics. Yes, <laughs> you will also have that. But let's start now with, uh, with the science. And, uh, and I'm sure uh, with, uh, with this lecture there must be a number of uh, burning questions out there in the audience. And we have a microphone running here. So if you, if you, if you have a question for Eva, please uh, raise your hand. So I would like to start with your definition of consciousness. And the main part that I remember is a subjective feeling, which kind of assumes that there's someone feeling there. Um, And this means that this entity should be self-aware in some sense. And then um, I wonder, is self-awareness part of your concept there? And how do you distinguish then consciousness from self-consciousness? And maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. It comes up uh, sometimes because I think that self, uh, the, the, the point about self-awareness is that we use it in two senses. The one is that there is somebody who actually senses. There is an animal that has pain. But the other one is that there is an animal who, who thinks that it has pain and considers whether that and, and has ideas about this pain. Now, the first sense of self-awareness, the first one, that there is somebody who, who feels a pain and that therefore there is a someone, doesn't mean that you have, that you have, to, that you have metacognition. So when we're using, uh, so we're talking about self and we're talking about the, uh, the, some kind of minimal self that you can have in a sense, 
that also Damasio is talking about and other people are talk, talking about, other scientists, uh, other people who are dealing with this subject are talking about. But we're not talking about metacognition, about the necessity for higher order thoughts. We don't need that. A baby doesn't have higher order thoughts. Nevertheless, a baby has a very good capacity to feel pain. So this is what we're interested in. Now, in order to have this capacity, Yes, it is, there is a very complex, you need to assume that there is a very complex kind of representation of the body already. And that there is this ability that I was talking about that very simple animals have to distinguish between the effects of a stimulus that comes from the world and the effect of the same stimulus that comes because of you are doing it. So for example, a worm that is crawling on the ground is feeling the ground, but is, it, it doesn't have the reflex of freezing. It goes on because it is, fi- is doing this uh, crawling. On the other hand, if you suddenly take a worm and change the environment for it, make it feel this coarseness in the environment that before it didn't feel, it will freeze. Whereas if it is itself going through this coarse environment, moving from one type of environment to another, it will not, it will, it, it will not freeze. So, because it, it is inhibiting the, ref, the freezing inf, uh, reflex. So this is very, very elementary capacity of animals. Now this capacity is not sufficient for consciousness. We think that in order to have consciousness, you have to also, to add to this, the capacity to learn, to, 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 to incorporate learned things that were learned in the past. And then you, can, you, you, you need a more complex system. But this doesn't require metacognition. And a lot of people, like uh, some uh, uh, theorists, second-order theorists, when they're thinking, they're saying you have to have metacognition. I don't think so. I don't think you need this. So it depends what you mean by a self, self-consciousness and self-image. Thank you for a very, much, uh, very nice talk and analysis. Uh, I have some questions. You, you said that some species, uh, that you take off uh, the, the UAL on different species, low species. What about now robots and multimodal large language models? Do they tick off some of these boxes or increasingly do that? Yes. So I'm going to talk about it actually <laughs> uh, tomorrow a little bit because uh, it's, we don't have an unlimited associative learning uh, capacity in robots. It's a very big, uh, you know, global uh, intelligence, uh, general global intelligence, things like that. It's a big, uh, big thing in robotics, and people are thinking about how to do it, and they're thinking that if you put together all kinds of modules, you will be able to do it. Now, I want you, I want, it's a good opportunity to clarify some things. I don't know if... Uh, I think that at the moment, robots are not ticking these boxes, okay? They are very, very far from it, more far than we think. They can do wonderful things that we can't do, accomplish fantastic things, but in very narrow uh, domain, including the linguistic domain. The linguistic domain is one domain. Okay, they can do fantastic things, and they can also uh, win a chess game easily against most of us, or all of us here. But... The, that, that's it. But and they can do all. And some of them can do more than one game, yes. And and the, the language models are incredibly interesting. But they they don't have this unlimited associative learning at all. They don't. Now the question. One of the questions is. There are two questions here. One is okay. One day let, let's imagine that one day they will have it. And then if we want to imagine it, we can ask. Well, what does it require actually? to have unlimited associative learning in robots. Does it, for example, require that they will not be made of hard parts, but that they will be made, but does it require a different kind of uh, uh, realization in matter? Maybe soft matter is necessary because it's pliable, because it's plastic, because some people think so. Does it require a hierarchical value system that has nevertheless some kind of common denominator so that the parts and the whole interact in a way that is coordinated because they have 
some kind of common de- very strong common denominator? Do we know what they are? Do we know how many levels they are? Do we need development, and what kind of development do we need? There is developmental robotics, for example. It's a, it's a branch of robotics. And people are talking about the need to learn sequentially, write, and develop behavior. Learn one thing, and the top, then another thing, and then another thing. And only in this way can you come to really, really complex behaviors. But then the question is, but do you also need morphological changes for that? Because morphological changes create constraints and affordances that otherwise wouldn't be in place. So there are a lot of open questions that most, most people just don't ask. But when you're taking seriously this UAL business, then you have to ask them. Because it demands so much. So I don't know. I think if we'll have a robot or something like that that shows UAL, I will be very careful with it. I will try not to hurt its feelings. <laughs> Uh, and then here. and uh, thank you so much for your uh, speech first. It is super inspiring. I, I love it. And uh, I'm just thinking about if, uh, if the theory could be like a, a way of explaining why people start to tell story, or why people tell a story, because there's a strong theory nowadays about uh, people experience the world, that like people's conscious, uh, conscious and uh, people's mind is in a sort of narrative way. We experience the world. Uh, based on the event-based uh, experience, and we like we predict the future uh, based on the event we experience in the past. So it is a very strong uh, theory about like uh, our mind is structured in a way like the storytelling. So I'm just thinking of uh, if the theory could be a way of explain why why our consciousness become the way like it is story-based. So why we predict the future based on the event that we recalled from the past. Right. Now, there is quite a lot of work on that. And the people like Daniel Schachter in Harvard are doing a lot of work on the relationship between imagination in humans and episodic memory. Right. And there is a lot of overlap between the areas in the brain that light up when you remember and the areas that light up when you plan for the future or you imagine the future. There is a lot, a lot of uh, overlap between this, but not complete overlap. There are some areas that are slightly different. I don't think we understand fully this, uh, these things. I think it's, it's, an, it's one of the things, imaginative consciousness in general, especially in, in humans, yes, the narrative aspect is extremely important. In other animals, I think that the, there is imagination, but I think that the narrative aspect is much less important. It does, it's not that it doesn't exist. It probably does exist to some extent, but to a small extent. So... There, there is no question that, uh, that imagination is based on some kind of combinatorial putting together of, uh, of memories and transfor- transformation of, transformations of memories. And uh, as I said, the best person uh, to consult is the books of uh, Daniel Schachter, uh, who, who wrote a lot about it, and he has a, a very active lab that is dealing exactly with your question. So one more question here. And maybe if, if anybody is burning to get a signed copy of a book, maybe you should sneak out and, and buy one and then come back with it. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, as a master's student, I'm at a very confusing point in my life right now because I'm reading a lot and I'm not understanding even more. So uh, I'm and, in the and, same place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and this is uh, not so much an, um, an exemption from that rule. Uh, so the question I've had for the longest since you started talking today is if you have, during your uh, search for answers in consciousness uh, research, uh, identified a key or a handful of key selection pressures that could lead to consciousness. Look, if you accept that unlimited associative learning is a marker of consciousness, then the evolution of learning has been driving has, is what led to consciousness. It is constituted by this thing. It's not a byproduct. It is made up of these things in the same way that the liver is made up of cells. It's not a byproduct of its cells, right? It's made up of them. If you think that this is what happened, now, of course, I mean, learning is an incredible adaptation. And unlimited associative learning, associative learning in general, but especially 
unlimited associative learning, is a quantum leap in adaptability. You adapt during your ontogenetic life. You don't need the mutation selection, right? It's, it's an incredible thing. I mean, and not every animal has it. There are some animals that learn, but they learn through non-associative learning, habituation and sensitization. That's also great. But once you have associative learning, you know, a whole world opens up. And when you have this ability for gen generative representational, cumulative, uh, recursive learning that is what UAL gives you, well, you know, the world, there's no limit to it. It's hugely adaptive. That's why it drove the Cambrian explosion because once animals were able to learn, this drove a lot of adaptations in other animals. They're monsters, those animals who can learn. They can learn who is the predator, who is the prey. Uh, you know, they can learn all kinds of things. They drive also, probably drive the ability to learn in other lineages and so on and so forth. That's why we think it's a dri one of the drivers. It's not the only driver. Um, uh, the Cambrian is a very, very complex uh, era but one of the important drivers of the Cambrian explosion. So it has a huge, if you accept, you have to accept that, un, that associative learning, is, uh, unlimited associative learning is a good mar is, is a marker, of course. If you accept that, there's no problem. Okay, um, Eva, maybe this is a... Uh... I think so. Well, first of all, the brain has been lost during evolution several times. I mean, the brain is a great adaptation, yeah, but like many good things, it was uh, lost during evolution when it was not necessary. So I think it probably was lost. We don't know when, but I think in, uh, all kind, in arthropods that became parasitic, for example, if they, had some, if they had UAL and they became parasitic, they lost it, probably. But, okay. you know, it, it's a good thing to have you here on more, the whole. Okay, one, uh, one more question, and then uh, maybe we should switch topic. <laughs> if you want. <laughs> uh, got a question. Um, do humans are equal in self I, I'm a little bit deaf, so please, okay. please, if you can talk. <laughs> are humans equal in self-consciousness, according to you? Yes. Yes. So, no, I didn't, I didn't get it, sorry. <laughs> I said, are humans equal in self-consciousness or not? You know, self-consciousness is to some extent, self-consciousness in the main, in the, uh, you mean by metacognition. I think we are all capable of it. Whether or not we exercise it, I think it's a cultural and social uh, question. I think in some societies this is very, very important and everybody goes to a psychologist. And, uh, and in some societies, uh, people spend less time about ruminating about their own, uh, yeah, but we are all capable of it to a lo very large extent. We all have metacognition, all of us, every human being on this planet, except people who are, uh, you know, have brain damage or of one or different types. But otherwise, yes, of course we are. But the level and the expression of this thing is culturally, uh, is, is very, depending, very dependent on, on culture, how it is expressed. But the capacity is there for, and, and it is expressed at some level in all human beings. Okay. Do right. you have any, should, should we switch to Yes, uh, yeah, we can any, switch. Any yes, yes, yes. Anything you want. Um, Anything you want. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so he was first. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, my English is a little bad, but okay. Uh, uh, what do you think about the political situation in Gaza today and the solution, like how can we solve this problem, but still ignore the fundamental problem of 1948 and 19, 1947? Yeah, it's a very difficult question. Uh, what I think about the current situation is that the war has to stop. I think that the only solution to the current situation is a political solution. 
when you're talking about 1947 and 19, now, and, and I think that the only viable solution for the conflict in the Middle East is a two-state solution, that there will be a Palestinian state alongside an Israeli state. This is what I believe is the only viable solution at the moment. One day, maybe, when we don't have nations anymore, there will be another better solution, but at the moment, this is the best. Now, how to implement it? and how to deal with the Nakba of 1948 is a very good question and a very difficult one because we cannot go back completely, but we have to acknowledge our responsibility for what happened and to deal with it. There are many, many, uh, uh, many, many people have been breaking their head about this and trying to figure out how we can, how we can deal with it. As I say, I don't believe that you can displace uh, Jews in order to replace uh, the Palestinians back because I don't think you can do one injustice by doing another. There are certain things. However, some compromises have to be made. But as I say, I'm not a politician uh, and a specialist in this thing, but I can tell you that there are many ideas about it and very serious people are taking it very seri this question very seriously and rightly so. Compromises will have to be made on both sides I mean, there are very, very strong positions on the Palestinian side. There are very strong positions on the Israeli side. And some kind of compromise, which is never, ha which is never a happy compromise for everyone, will have to be made. I mean, we'll have to swallow a lot of frogs on both sides. But we have to do it. And I, I really think, and one of the things that we have to accept is that the Palestinian, we, Israelis, I'm talking as an Israeli now, that we have to accept that justice has to be made for the Palestinians, that they have to have their independence, they have to have their sovereignty, they have to have their freedom. How exactly to implement the two-state solution within the Green Line with some compromises about this or that territory? I, you know, I, don't, I cannot go into, in, into these things, but I think this is the... And we have to respect the ideas and the, and the feelings of the other side. And that has to be reciprocated also. And I think that the Palestinians, including people who are presently at the, in, in the Hamas, have to accept us, Israelis, as, legit, as, as something that, can exist, that has the right to, for, for a state as well. I mean, this has to be, it has to be. Otherwise, there will never be peace. And if, I think that there is enormous and very understandable mistrust on both sides. Incredible one, and especially now what, what is happening in Gaza is a tragedy beyond description. So I don't know how it will, how, how it will affect the possibilities of peace, but you know, if I'm thinking about the Second World War and about what happened in Germany, I mean, people were saying, you know, Never, never will the Jews be able to look even in the eyes of a German. Now we have very good relations with the Germans now. Yes, I mean, it is possible for people to overcome the past and to build up some kind of honorable future, but we have to accept it and we have to do it. And at the moment, I must say, my government is not doing it. Just a second. <laughs> Thank you for the lecture. It was really nice to hear you speak about something you're very passionate about. Um, and yeah, over to the political question. Uh, according to Israeli newspaper, the ha Haaretz, Haaretz, I'm sorry if I butchered mm -hmm. that. Haaretz, yeah. Um, uh, you have uh, signed a petition that calls for academic boycott of Israeli inst institutions. I was just wondering if that source is correct? It's correct and incorrect. I mean, there was a, an academic, uh, uh, a friend of mine, Patrick Bateson, uh, signed a petition, uh, asked me what I think about the petition of academic boycott in 2002. 
when there was a, uh, uh, after the, uh, during the second intifada and I said that I think that this is a legitimate uh, action that this is politically legitimate I, and uh, I said that's all I don't I didn't I, I clarified afterwards that I don't think that academic <laughs> I will explain I think that boycott is a, a, a legitimate a political way of pressurizing. However, I think that if you are doing an academic boycott and only an academic boycott, this is counterproductive. The academics are, <laughs> are not the, the, the major target of a, of a boycott. Okay, as an academic, I cannot say, well, you boycott everybody else but not me. Of course I can't say that. <laughs> Yes, I mean, this is ridiculous and this is a kind of hypocrisy. But I think that uh, if you want to boycott, you have to do it in a clever way and to, uh, to target the kind of uh, organizations and the kind of, uh, uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, not people, not individual people, the institutions that are, that are really most uh, responsible for it. Targeting just academics is silly, mm -hmm. right? But as, as I say, because I am an academic, I cannot exclude myself. I mean, because this would be, you know, crazy. Mm -hmm. So this is my position. I made it clear, but, uh, you know, you can talk. <laughs> Thank you for your insight. I, I just want to follow up on that. Um, so when us students and professors, when we call for an academic boycott, we want to add pressure, uh, as you mentioned, uh, but we do not want to add pressure on academics. We do not want yeah, I understand academic that. freedom to be uh, threatened. We, how can we, how can we, in the context of an academic boycott, uh, ensure that professor to professor relationships um, can still continue. How can we have, a, we, we want an institutional boycott because Tel Aviv is directly involved in the brutal treatment of Palestinians and they play a key role in the military and state level. So the institution is our target, not academics such as you. How can we take care of you and still go after the university? It's you know, it's question. a very difficult question, to be honest with you. It's, uh, I am, uh, I be, I, I'm retired, right? But I do belong to Tel Aviv University. It's uh, my academic home. Yeah? And uh, it's not one of the worst institutions in Israel. In terms, I mean, they can swallow people like me. And I have been very vocal about what I think. And they accept it, and they never had any problems from them. They also are doing all kinds of things in order to support Palestinian students and Palestinian staff at the moment. In Tel Aviv, I'm not talking about other universities. There are also other things that are unacceptable from your point of view, and I understand it completely. I don't know really how to answer you. I think that what you are trying to say, that, that you cannot really divorce me completely from my institution and from my country. You can't. It's, it's, it's very difficult because, you, you know, so you have to really think very carefully. For example, I'll give you an example, from my, my own example. There is a university in Israel, uh, not in Israel, in, uh, in, in the West Bank, which is called Ariel University. It is in the West Bank. I think it is illegitimate to have a university there in the occupied territories because they are occupied territories. They, belong, they do not belong to us. We don't have the right to do this. I would not talk in this university, okay? And I said, made it, made it clear. And, you know, I made it clear. I am not going to talk there. If they invite me, I say, thank you very much. I'm not coming, right? This is my way of responding to this kind of situation. You know, there are many other things that I would do. Uh, you know, it's where you put your red line. I really cannot answer your question because I think it's an imp really an impossible situation. But you have to be clever, strategically clever, to know how to deal with things like this. What is, where do you, do you say, you know, here, no. Yes, and, and it's very, but you will not find a 100% tight justification for what you're doing. 
there will always be problems, in my so, opinion. So, so Eva, I, th I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to have to stop this discussion because we have to be out of this room in 10 minutes. And I think maybe we have something for you, Eva, and towards the end. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, coming to us and giving this lecture. Thank you for uh, coming here. Uh, this has been uh, two very nice, fantastic hours of uh, learning for us. The next opportunity for something which is not like this, but still may be worthwhile, is tomorrow at uh, 4 o'clock in Real Fabrique. Then there is a discussion about can we afford uh, the green shift by NTBA, Norsk Teknisk uh, Natur. Teknisk Naturvetenskapliga Kommer. 4.30. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's in Norwegian. There is some food from 4 and the meeting starts at 4.30. And then, Eva, in Bergen, if we are thinking about something useful, and of course underwear is the most useful. It but, is. But <laughs> after underwear, the umbrella comes out as uh, the first thing we think about. I know that you come from a, a different place. That, uh, it's pretty cold in Jerusalem. <laughs> but but uh, please take okay. this as a token that we think that this is the most valuable thing we can give to somebody. Thank you very much. I will cherish this umbrella. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention and for everything and for your great hospitality.